looky, looky what we have here. <laughs> Ball cactus berries. In Blackfoot, these are called Wotstutsimon. Wotstutsimon. And they're very, very good. Mmm. <laughs> Juicy. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, they're really good tasting berries. Of course, we got two species of cactus out here. The uh, prickly pear and the ball cactus. Um, both of them produce fruits that are edible. But the ball cactus berries are delicious. Absolutely delicious. Um, they grow on the, on the edges of the coulee rim. And on the tops of coulee ridges. Uh, where you got the short grass, the old style short grass prairie. Um, well worth coming out and uh, having a taste if you live anywhere around the coolies in southern Alberta. <laughs> um, maybe a month ago, maybe more, I posted a, a video that included some harvesting of plants. And somebody commented and asked whether I could put together a, a, a tutorial on indigenous ethics in harvesting uh, wild foods and particularly plant foods. Uh, they were concerned that, you know, I was showing some plants out there that were useful, uh, but that they might be over harvested by people viewing the videos. And it would be good to know some of the harvest ethics. So. I've thought about it um, for a while now. <laughs> Actually, I had my response about a week later. I was ready, but I just haven't sat down and recorded it. Um, but I'll give it to you today, and I'll try to make it fairly brief, so that because this is the kind of thing that could be a whole lecture, and it could go on and on. Um, but I've narrowed down to what I think are four really core important points. And those are the ones that I'll talk about. Now, of course, when you ask about something, you know, to, to, for me to speak about indigenous ethics around plant harvest, that's such a broad category. I can't really address that because um, it's just too large. And there's, there's many, many cultures, uh, indigenous, all around the world. And everybody has you know, different ways of dealing with things. Um, my main exposures have been training in Blackfoot practices. Um, and I've been exposed somewhat to training in Kalapuya practices in Western Oregon um, and to the Hoopa from Northern California. But, um, but my, yeah, my main core is Blackfoot, right? So yeah. I've, I've come up with four things, four things that I think are very important regarding the harvest and the ethics around it and that kind of thing. So here we go. Let's see. So the first point I'll just call okakyosit. Okakyosit means be highly aware. Be highly aware of your environment, all the players in your environment, and their relationships to one another. If you're engaged in the, in the wild harvest and you're not aware of the life of the plant or animal that you're harvesting from and you don't know their ecological relationships, then yeah, you're, you're in jeopardy of over-harvesting. And that's always a concern. You don't want to over-harvest. And so as a general rule, I think in cases where you don't know, you really don't know that that species well, you're not fully versed in, in their natural history, then you shouldn't harvest very much. But there's other kind of, what would you call them? Generalities, I guess, that you can, that you can turn to. For instance, when you're dealing with the babies or the unborn, you have to understand that, that nature is set up to overproduce the babies. Because 
the reality is that everybody eats the babies. Summer is in many ways a, a feast of babies. All of us are out there eating the, the unborn or the recently born, the ones that are, that are easy pickings. And this is true in both the animal world and the plant world. And so if you're dealing with plants and you're out picking berries, well, berries are the unborn. They're the unborn babies. And a general rule <laughs> or generality that you can understand about that is that um, when it comes to the babies, you can harvest pretty clean, right? If you're working with plants and you've ever been out with your, you know, grandma, <laughs> um, and you're you're an indigenous person, your grandma's probably, you know, got on your case about not picking the berries clean on the on the bushes that you're working, right? Whether it's raspberries or Saskatoons or you know huckleberries or what have you. With the berries, you can you can really harvest. You can harvest a lot because those are the babies, and it's meant to be that way, right? They they produce a lot um, because because we feed off of the berries um, and, the, and the babies regularly. So, but when it comes to other things like roots or, you know, the, the plant um, itself, the stems, the flowers and leaves and these kind of things, then you really have to know your plant. And that's where my rule, my akakios and or uh, Okakyosit is more of a command. <laughs> be aware. Be aware. And if you're not aware, then don't harvest too much. Right? But you need to know that plant or that animal in order to know whether or not you're going to really impact um, the population by harvesting. You know, there's a lot of roots that are okay to harvest. Um, they have mechanisms you know, survival mechanisms already in place where it's really difficult to get the whole root out. You're going to get pieces of that root and the, the remainder is going to grow a new plant. There's lots of roots that are like that. But there are others that if you harvest the root, <laughs> that's that takes one plant out of that population, absolutely. And, um, you know, you think about like like lilies, for instance, um, lilies, uh, you know, plants that have bulbs as their root. Some of those bulbs are really delicious. They're great. They're great tasting and everything, and they're good to eat and you should harvest them, but you got to be careful not to over harvest. Even things like what I call a, in Blackfoot, Nisitsikapas, the wild carrot that grows out here. Some people call it yampa. Um, Yampa is very susceptible to over harvesting and so you gotta you gotta be careful in fact I think maybe that's why Lethbridge doesn't even have any Yampa left it should this is a perfect environment for Yampa but it's not here and I think probably because it's, it's so delicious and it was over harvested um, so you have to have strategies for not taking too much my my late friend uh, Narcissus Blood, my late friend and in-law, used to tell a good story about his grandpa, um, Joe Heavyhead. And he said, uh, Narcissus, he says that he himself, when he was a boy, he went down to the, to the bullhorn, um, in the bullhorn coulee behind his place, and he was catching pike. And he caught a really nice pike. He brought it back to the house. And when he showed it to, to old Joe, um, the old man praised him, like really talked, you know, right away got up and started cleaning the fish and made a big deal about, you know, how nice it was gonna be to have fish dinner and everything and cleaned it and cooked it up and everybody enjoyed it and made Narcissus feel really good, you know, that he had done this as a boy. And then he set out, he went out a couple of days later and he caught like five fish. And he thought, you know, I'm going to bring these back and present them to, to grandpa. And, um, gee, if he was, if he was happy about me before, wait till he sees this. 
and the effect that he got was not at all what he expected because when the old man saw it his his head just dropped and he told told him uh son we don't need that many fish you shouldn't have done that so okakyosit <clears throat> be aware be aware and be careful about the over harvesting thing try to learn all the players all everybody that's out here all the plants and animals learn who relies on what you know if you're taking if you're taking food probably you're taking food that somebody else uses too you should know who else uses that food and you can kind of if you know those relationships and you know those animals then you can make better judgments on how to harvest without taking away because ultimately we want a better future right we always want a better future more abundance in the future and this brings me to point number two the second point the second uh, important message about harvesting is do not take the best specimens you want the best to repopulate for the future. I remember going into a archeological collection at, I think it was Portland State University in Oregon. I was working for the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde at the time, which are most of the tribes of the Willamette Valley of Western Oregon. I was helping them repatriate their ceremonial items and, <clears throat> and their ancestors um, who had been excavated out of the ground in the in the valley and by different organizations so i was going through the the collections at at uh in portland at one of the universities there and the archaeologist who was leading me through the collections um made sure to note that some of the acorns that were in the collection were bigger than any acorns that are being produced off of the trees you know at current and some of the elk bones indicated that the elk were much larger um, than they are currently and what they think about this and I, I tend to uh, to agree that this is probably the case was that this has to do with what you might call land management or wildlife management from an indigenous way um, and that means not taking the best specimens out of the system. And this is, this is exactly the reverse of how most mainstream hunters operate. Because a lot of them look for the biggest specimens, the most grand specimens, because they're going to hang a head on their wall. <laughs> so they look for the guy with the giant rack and they kill him. You know, and these are the, the this is, <laughs> this is uh, adverse um, to, to uh, managing a population of a particular species that's going to be more abundant. And, you know, for the future, it's like, <laughs> this should be no news for gardeners. You know, this is the way that gardening and agriculture has worked all along is uh, you take the best specimens from your garden and those are the seeds that you save for the for the next year right you make sure that those ones reproduce that's how it should be with your wild harvest as well you make sure that you don't take the ones that are you know magnificent um so beautiful you know you want more like them in the future if you want more like them, you can't take them out of the system. Leave them there. <laughs> That's That should be a, a real easy ethics. But uh, it's something that, that a lot of people don't follow because if they're out there harvesting and they find something that's just big and juicy and great and perfect, like if I'm out here picking cactus berries today and I come across this cactus that has like five, four or five really big juicy berries, uh, the temptation is to grab them, you know, but in reality, I should really be thinking, no, those are the ones that I want to, uh, to reseed for the future. So I'm going to leave those alone. 
ethical rule or message number three. <laughs> um, Atsimskasit. Make amends. Reciprocate in the relationship uh, with the species that you're harvesting. What can you do for them? They're doing something for you. What can you do for them? You know, in general, what happens in, in, in today's world, when people are being traditionally trained, um, is that they'll leave a little pinch of tobacco. If they're, if they're picking berries or something, leave a little pinch of tobacco um, and speak to the plants, you know, about your gratitude for what what they're giving you. And different people have different ways of what they say, you know. Some people are taught to uh, to ask the plants to go to sleep so that they won't so that they won't feel the injury of the harvest. Um, but in general, that reciprocation. Now, that continues today um, with little pinches of tobacco that people will give back. But I think today um, that doesn't mean the same thing. And I myself don't use tobacco very often like that. Uh, maybe if I'm just introducing somebody to indigenous ways of harvesting or something, I might take them through that so that they know that. But to me, um, toba the tobacco, uh, unless you're growing it yourself and you're making that sacrifice and giving it, because in the past, this is why tobacco is such an important gift, because it's a rare commodity. Um, you know, your whole, your whole band, your whole, your whole uh, community might have a little tobacco garden over the summer, and that tobacco gets distributed among everybody through ceremony, and then everybody's just got this little bit, and that's got to last all year, <laughs> and so. If you have a, a special guest over and you and you offer them a smoke, that's a really big gesture because you're giving something that you just don't have very much of. Um, and if you're out harvesting, it's the same thing. That gesture of you're actually you're sacrificing something of yourself that, of, of yours that's valuable to you um, because you're taking something. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're giving back. You're reciprocating something of value. In my opinion, <laughs> the tobacco that you can go to the store and buy does not have that kind of value. Just, it's just not the same thing. Um, so I don't, I don't typically use tobacco as my offerings. Or if I do, it's from the tobacco that I grow that's the old seed from the beaver bundles. Um, which I don't even grow every year. I didn't grow any this summer. But I do. I have in past years. But you should be thinking about what else you can do. What else? How can you reciprocate? How can you give back? What can you do for the ones that, are, that you're taking from? Um... <laughs> Back to my late friend Narcissus. He and I spent a lot of time together. We spent about 20 years traveling together and uh, working very closely, very synergistically uh, between the two of us. And one time, Al Gore, his people had were trying to get a hold of Narcissus, and they phoned Red Crow College. And I was working there at the time, and Narcissus was in the program that I was working. I was I was the director of that program, Ghana Studies. I answered the phone and they told me they were looking for Narciss. They heard he was a very charismatic speaker. Um, they wanted to bring him back east to train him in climate science presentation so that he could go to native communities in Canada and teach climate science, um, global warming, and this kind of thing. And so uh, Narciss wasn't there that day, and I told him, I gave him Narciss's number. But then right away when I hung up, I phoned Narciss myself. And I told him, uh, hey, if they're bringing you back 
to go train in, in climate science and you're going to get to meet Al Gore I want to go with. <laughs> so uh, they phoned Narciss, tried to recruit him into this thing. And he told them, well, normally when, when I do public speaking, a lot of times I'll do it in tandem with Ryan. It would be good if we were both we both went to this event, this training. And, uh, and they said, well, you know, this is really a rare opportunity. We're only bringing about 200 people from all throughout Canada, all different kinds of demographics and such represented there. And we don't really need two people for the native demographic. And Narcissus said, well, if Ryan's not going to go, then I don't really want to go. And then they, then they relented and they said, uh, okay, we'll bring, we'll bring Ryan. And so about a week later, they were talking to us and they said, uh, you know, everybody else has had to compete for these seats. Um, you guys don't have to compete. You're in. We've recruited you. We've asked you to do this. But just so that we have, you know, everything squared away, all our paperwork and it looks good. If you guys could each write up even just a one paragraph or a one pager on why you want to be involved in this training. And uh, so we agreed to do that. And then I wrote my paper and everything and submitted it, emailed it off to them. And then uh, a few weeks later they called and they were setting up the travel, the air, the air travel and stuff. And <laughs> they said... Well, we've got your paper. You're all good to go. Um, we're going to put you on the plane and get you the hotel and all this stuff. Um, Narciss never gave us his one pager, so we can't bring Narciss. So I told them, well, if Narciss isn't going to go, I don't, I'm not going. Right? <laughs> they forced their hand again, and they relented, and they brought us both. And it was a two-day exercise. It involved Al Gore for most of the first day. David Suzuki was there. Uh, he played a big role in a lot of the training. And when all was said and done, day one was just looking at the evidence of global warming and what the, the homeostatic mechanisms of the Earth do in response to that. Day two was all about solutions or proposed solutions. And so we listened to all that, came away from it, went to go have dinner after the, the second day of the session. And Narcissus and I are sitting at dinner and he says, well, you know Rhett, what, they, uh, to me, they just miss Ot Simpskots and all together. There's no reciprocation. There's no giving back. All of their solutions are still just take less. Reduce, reuse, recycle carbon capture whatever it's all about taking less there's no give back and that's the difference hey eh? that's the difference there needs to be a give back um, in all of our economic relationships with this earth there should be a give back so yeah atsimpskas and reciprocate okay my fourth and final point <laughs> Um, my final ethics around the natural harvest and this came to me from my teachings with the beaver bundle the first year we had the beaver bundle uh, as we went out to go harvest Saskatoons that we use with our pemmican that we use in making berry soup uh, both of which are, are some of the traditional fare that we serve to people at the ceremony for the beaver bundle openings. Um, as we went out to do that, my elder, the late Alan Pard, Mikskimitsogatsim, made a point of uh, telling me, since you guys are going out to harvest, uh, make sure that you get enough for others. Don't just pick for yourself. If you're out there, if you're out there uh, harvesting, you should be thinking about others because not everybody's going to be able to get out there and do that. And so, whenever you're whenever you're harvesting, this is an important indigenous ethics. I think is uh, don't just don't just think about yourself. Um, really, out here, <laughs> there's so many different things to harvest. Even if you're at it full time all summer long, 
you're not going to be able to harvest all the different kind of things that are out here to harvest so if you if you want to have that big diversity in your diet you would have to rely on the generosity of others who are harvesting some things that you weren't and sharing that and you in turn the same way if i'm out here harvesting otsutsuman i need to pick enough of these berries both for myself and for other people for some you know maybe enough for a couple of two three different families so i can give some away just always keeping that in mind the idea of of using some of these being generous getting getting some for others as well so that's my last point <laughs> um i hope you enjoyed these there's of course lots more about in indigenous ethics around harvest but when i sat down and thought about it i th i think those are are the four keys to me that that seem really really crucial